Good evening, I'm Alexandra Lewis. And I'm Marshall Zellinger. Within the last hour, Aurora City Council voted, as expected, to confirm the next police chief, Todd Chamberlain. Nine News reporter Kelly Rinke was at that meeting. And Kelly, people in Aurora are not happy with the lack of transparency in this process. Yeah, Alex and Marshall, the community criticized Aurora last time for selecting three white men as finalists for the police job in the state's most diverse city. But this time around, there was no community conversation, no community forum. And despite residents telling council members tonight that they didn't trust this process, only two council members voted no on Todd Chamberlain. Take a listen. People yelled things like vote them out and shame on you after a vote approved Chamberlain as police chief. He's the sixth person to take that role since 2019. Residents told council members their upset community was left out of this process. One council member who voted yes spoke to defend Chamberlain's appointment. It wasn't received very well. You didn't have a problem getting qualified candidates in the pool because of their public um, the public knowing what they're doing. You had a problem because this is the Aurora Police Department. Nobody wants this job. We, everyone agrees we've had revolving door of interim police chiefs and we need stability in this department. You guys want accountability. You want us to have better training. This is what he's about. And <laughs> I, you know, I respected you. I did not laugh when you were speaking. I would expect the same respect, please. As community members chanted after that vote was made, council members stood up and they finished the rest of the meeting virtually in a different room. Live in Aurora, I'm Kelly Rinke, 9 News. The city of Boulder is allowing community input tomorrow before it chooses between three finalists for that city's new police chief. Stephen Redfern has been the interim chief of Boulder Police since January. He joined the department as a deputy chief in 2021 after 22 years with Aurora Police. Leonard Redhorse is a deputy chief with the Navajo Police Department on the Arizona-New Mexico border. He's been there for 18 years. And Josh Wallace is a commander with the Chicago Police Department where he's been for 25 years. Tomorrow night at 6, the city will introduce all three of these at a community forum at City Council, which will also be live streamed on the city's YouTube page. We were greeted with a mix of clouds and sun to kick off the week. It was a cool start to the morning, and then temperatures started to rise. We got into the 80s today, but higher heat accompanied with a dry trend is expected to return tomorrow. So let's check in with Kathy Sabin. What a lovely start to the week, though. I can't complain. Oh, it was so nice. Right, Marshall? Did you love it? You know this is my kind of weather. When we're, when we're getting away from the 90s, getting closer to this, you said 70s in the, fi in the 70s, yeah, so I, like I know it. that's my The point. 9 News Weather Impact Team aims to please you guys. <laughs> huh? And how about this? I mean, look at these great pictures coming in of the sunset tonight. We had the cloud cover to make that happen. I don't know if we're going to have that so much the next couple of days. There's a major pattern shift. We're tracking isolated showers tonight, but really kicking off a calmer, drier weather pattern that could last right into the upcoming holiday weekend. And who is and thinking about the holiday weekend on a Monday. Uh, we're down to 70 after a high of 88 today. These are comfortable numbers this hour. And the winds are light, shifting, coming in out of the west and southwest, picking up a bit in Greeley and over some of those higher passes, but not impactful for those that are traveling over I-70. Here's where all the weather is. Look at that tropical plume of moisture dropping those heavy showers in southeastern Colorado. Nothing really severe, but a lot of water across the eastern plains. These uh, thunderstorms are slowly moving east out of the area. They will move completely completely out in the next hour and then we have fair skies and light winds. Whole lot of lightning though, quite the light show down around Springfield and Kim and Lamar. But the severe weather threat really well east of our forecast area during the overnight hours. So temperatures in the 70s now will drop into the 60s overnight. We have a lovely day coming up tomorrow and a preview of fall in the extended forecast. Marshall, you don't want to miss that. I will not. Missing puppies may be able to help deputies identify the person who killed an Idaho Springs man. A search party of friends found 57-year-old Paul Peavy dead on his property Saturday. He'd been reported missing a few days before. Peavy was a dog breeder. And the sheriff's office believes as many as 10 of his Doberman puppies are now missing. All those puppies have microchips. Deputies believe they may have been sold through social media sites as early as this past Tuesday, they're asking anyone who bought a Doberman puppy in the area within the last week to check for a microchip and contact law enforcement. 
Jurors will be allowed to see the first moments Boulder police encountered the man charged with killing 10 people at the King Supers in Boulder in 2021. The judge made that decision today as the process for selecting jurors for the trial of Ahmad Elisa is just beginning. 375 people were told to report to court today to fill out questionnaires. That process will be repeated over the next several days until there are 1500 prospective jurors. Ultimately, prosecutors and defense attorneys will pick 12 jurors and several alternatives to ultimately hear the case. Nine News legal analyst Scott Robinson told us he's not surprised by how many people were summoned. Considering the size of Boulder and the fact that the case got so much publicity, uh, I think 1,500 is probably the minimum that the judge thinks is going to be needed. The shooter pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. During the trial, defense attorneys will present evidence to try to show their client was insane the day of the shooting. Then it's up to prosecutors to prove he was not insane at the time. Colorado lawmakers are back at the Capitol to again reduce upcoming increases on property taxes. It's the second special session in less than a year, and it began this morning. The main bill is already past the first step. It would reduce future increases a little bit more for property owners, just enough to make two conservative-backed property tax ballot issues go away. Those ballot issues would cap future increases, but could severely impact the state budget. One of the other bills under consideration in this special session would be sent to voters to approve. It's a constitutional amendment that would require local voters to approve property tax changes instead of a statewide one-size-fits-all vote. The bill's sponsors say it's an effort to reinforce local control. We are very interested in having local control of property taxes. That was the whole intent of Senate Bill 233. And so asking the voters to lock that in, I think is a, is a reasonable discussion that we should take a look at. Property taxes are local taxes. You pay them to your local school board. There's 178 of those. You pay them to your county or your city and county, 64 of those. Not a cent of property tax revenue uh, flows to the state coffers. All true statements, but the state is responsible for part of the overall math equation that ultimately determines your property tax bills. Even though one main bill was negotiated before the special session, there were 13 that were introduced today. Only four are still alive. The special session will last until at least Thursday. We're getting a new perspective tonight of what it's actually like to drive on a section of I-70 in Wheat Ridge. It's where three people in a car were killed earlier this month when a truck lost its load and tipped over in a construction zone. CDL 303 Trucking School allowed Nine News Investigates to place a camera on one of its 80,000 pound trucks as it drove on I-70 near Ward Road. That is right where the crash happened on August 15th. The posted speed limit, 60. But experienced truckers know to go much slower than that. The trucks that didn't slow down today had trouble staying in their lanes. In their best, but uh, when physics gets involved, when those descents get involved, if they don't have the skills to handle it, then bad things can happen. CDOT lowered the speed limit to 60 miles per hour after the crash. The agency says it's bringing it down even further to 55. Its crews also plan to install some new signs with flashing beacons that warn of a lane shift and slower speed limit. After months on the loose, the dog is now getting the care that he needs. As Night News reporter Rachel Kraus shows us, after the dog was reportedly shot, people pitched in to help find that pup. He's a little nervous guy, um, but he's been very sweet while he's been with us. This dog is getting some much needed R&R &R after a few months on the loose. Okay, love. Good Samaritans helped Animal Protection track him down after concerns this dog had been shot in the face. So Sunday morning I got to meet him. Um, he was pretty, you know, quiet, just kind of a little nervous guy, um, but he had this really bright red drool coming out of his mouth and you could see that his legs had the drool on it too. Denver Animal um, Shelter so veterinarian Patricia Crystal says x-rays helped uncover his injuries. I was able to retrieve two pieces of dark gray, heavy object um, from the lower part of his right jaw. She found fractured teeth, infection, and a fractured lower jaw. Near his mouth, Dr. Crystal spotted a hole. Whether the damage was due to a bullet, she says it's hard to say. But 
just from my examination, it does seem like there's a trajectory um, from the outside, you know, into the upper part of the jaw and then to the lower part of the jaw where that thing was lodged. Um, and that's where the fracture occurred as well. I can't say if it was intentionally or not, um, but I'm, you know, this isn't something that the, the dog would have inflicted upon himself. Now he's getting plenty of wet food and hot dogs, along with much needed meds and rest. I just checked on him this afternoon and he's still eating like a champ, so doing good. While this pup's road to recovery isn't certain just yet, Dr. Crystal says they're staying hopeful and grateful for everyone who helped get this sweet boy some help. So it's great that the community really came out and supported us and got him back here so we could give him some, some love and some care. <laughs> Dr. Crystal says fractures take dogs about six to eight weeks to heal, but because it's in his jaw, it could take a bit longer. And of course, they need to clear up the infection that's in his mouth. They are still hoping that they can get him healthy and possibly up for adoption at some point down the road. This is the story universally. We were just like, oh, oh. His little face, oh. I can't see him looking at his face. He's just, yes. he seems so sad. Yes, but a very sweet boy and getting good. all the care that good. he needs to hopefully help find a really good home. Yes, absolutely. We gotta follow this story. We've absolutely. gotta know that there's a happy ending here. Yes. Thank I think they should you. name him Chance because he's getting oh, such a chance. Oh, I love that. Boom. Thanks. Thanks, All Rachel. Right.